Hey everybody, free hat or t-shirt to whoever can guess which guitar I'm playing, and then another free hat to if you can guess what tuning I'm in. No right answers yet. Not number 36, not dad good. somewhat chromatic run all right let me uh turn the mic back on and we'll turn this screen off and i will reveal um whole step down d standard show alter open g let me come over here and turn this off ready but now here we go it's also black and white i don't know it just seems like the right mood i can change it here in a second but i was playing around with uh anyway what you're seeing now is now a flash forward i've been caught uh, I've been on the run, and I'm in the process of being caught by the DEA. That's why it's black and white. Um, but I was playing the Paget, the Model 1 from Mr. Ben Paget himself, which is, I mean, this is an effortless guitar. It's so light, and it's so nimble, and it sounds excellent. And uh, like if I do all this stuff... And I still have the Santa Cruz strings on here, and they've uh, I've they have won me over. All right, what's your take on the black and white? Keep it, or should we change it? We can change it to whatever, but it felt right in the moment, you know. Um, let's see if I can just use my mouse on my knee here. I'll come over to the comments. Daniel got it half. That's true. 
Which half of the shirt do you want? Not a show, Alter. Hey! Ben Padgett Model 1. That was the most right. I was half step down. Um, you want to go to full color? Good for now, or color is good. <laughs> yeah, either one. Do whatever you want. Um, no, we never sold the other pageant. It's still at a guitar shop in Northern Virginia, and I don't, I don't know why Daniel or no, not Daniel. Ben has recently said that he thinks that guitar is cursed um, because he thinks that it's just. Maybe not cursed, but I think it's too specky. It's Coco Bolo, which is not everybody's favorite choice of tone wood. It's an Engelman spruce top, which some people don't love because it's very white. Um, and then it's got that big rosette. And if anybody's going to spend that level of money on that kind of guitar, there are a bunch of builders that would do it around the same price, and you would get to make some choices in the construction of it. So I think Ben learned an unfortunate lesson in that. It's like he built two guitars on speculation, and that's just not great always. Um, so the, uh, yeah, I think if you were going to do it, you need to be just a little more straight down the middle, like not as intense of a, of an aesthetic, not as intense of a tone wood choice. Um, maybe it's probably just the aesthetic, but anyway, so it's still for sale. Um, yeah. So we'll probably change from color here in a bit. Um, they did. What did you like about the parabolics now versus before? When I first got them, they were so zingy and like mid pushed, mid pushed and a lot of troubles. And they weren't that bassy or low endy. And so now they've really mellowed out. I mean, it's been two months and I haven't played that guitar a ton since then. So, um, cause it normally stays in the house. I really like the black and white look. I might do a a video in black and white at some point. But we can go to the full color. I'll have to just change it here real quick. It's going to involve me getting close to the camera, so buckle in for some forehead shots. So look, here's what's crazy. Look how crazy that green is behind me. Now I'll change that color behind me too because that was just what looked best with black and white, which black and white is still seeing color, and it's dealing with colors in different ways. So... Let me come over here and swap it. Um, I also, yeah, I'll give you an update on this week. Let's go. I'm wearing a red shirt, so we'll do a blue. And we'll bring, that's kind of wild. I'm down at like, I like that shot. That's good contrast. Um, but yeah. Uh, anyway, how's the color now? Do you like that? Wizard of Oz vibes? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know why I went black and white. I just thought it was, it just looked very cool. It's There's way more contrast, which I thought was cool as I was getting ready. Uh, Clerks vibes. Brandon, that's a good, that's a good reference. Um, hi, guys. Hey, Sonia. Just finished the, fl the flute you had a commission on. That's exciting. You built a flute? Solid silver? No, it was like rosewood or something. Kelly Lee. Hey, buddy. Um, Kelly, I got an email, but I, I got your email and I got an email from Eastman, but neither are saying when the guitar is coming. So, um, Kelly and I are working a deal on, he's got a J45 and we've got, uh, a, we've got an Eastman, uh, coming that they keep telling me has already shipped. But anyway, we're just, we're getting there. Jose, Jose, in an hour, the buyer will come with the best price for the guitars and amps and collection I have for sale. Wish me best. Thanks, Jeremy, for all the help. Uh, man, Jose called me the other day. He's been a patron forever and just really, I mean, one of the people that made Guitar Hunter happen, especially during COVID time. Um, but Jose has an amazing collection of guitars, and he's ready to simplify and pare down. And he had Norm coming over. And so he came and asked me if I had any advice for how to negotiate. And I was like, you're going up against Norm. Like, Norm, uh, what's Norm's last name? whatever from norm's i think his last name is rare guitars um but norm uh he's been in the game a whole lot longer than i have so he's definitely going to be a better uh negotiator yes that norm uh called jose a little bit ago um hey oh greetings from greece guitar geeks greetings hello das Vidania. um yeah Lawrence is here. Kelly's here. Rasmus says, it's a wonderful flute. A, uh, a previous one was Brazilian Rosewood. I remember watching that. Harris, that's right. Norm Harris. Um, I would have come to that, but just 
It it is reality is different when you're sitting in here talking to a camera. Like I've met a bunch of you in person and you see that I'm not a lunatic. I feel a bit like a lunatic when I'm just in a room by myself talking to a camera. And I know that you guys are here and I know that you're interacting, but anyway. Uh and Toon Hermans. Uh hello from Holland. Hi. I'm headed to Holland. We're booking flights now. We're trying to figure out when to come. Because Rasmus is building a guitar for me, and it's going to be done, and we're going to try and go see the Fellowship of Acoustics and do a lot of cool things uh, in Holland. So, um, working on it. It should be really exciting. Ethan White says, I've played a Martin X series for years now. Watch your video on the Orangewood. I bought one with a solid sit good top. I love it. I hope to get an all solid. Thank you for, your, for all your content. Absolutely. Ethan, thanks for watching. Um, that's fun. That's a great... Uh, uh, it's a great guitar. So, um, I like the shop. Uh, Tweed Tone says I like the shop and the people, but some session players in the area, in the area that really despise. Sorry, I'm whatever part of my brain does um, reading comprehension is. I was doing lens therapy while I was in Nashville. That part of my brain is not working great. So, let me try it again from the top. I like the shop and the people, but I don't know some session players in the area that that really despite and say he's hated in the industry. I don't know. Oh, we're talking about Norm. I had a great time at the store and a, and a good deal. That's awesome. I've never met him. Um, apparently, he knows who I am. Several people have mentioned that he has watched my videos and know who I am. But I'm very much a little fish in most of that pond. I found a thing. I went to... I'll give you a quick update on this week. Um, on Wednesday, I went to Paul Reed Smith Guitars. If you follow me on Instagram, you saw that. I did a Q&A. Now, what I didn't know is that I wasn't able to film anything while I was there. And there's a lot of stuff that's just... Because I am now technically a PRS dealer, uh, I'm still not able to share. Like, I can't tell you that... And I also can't tell you that about that. Sorry, that's a dumb joke. Um, but there are a couple of exciting secrety things that are going to be announced the next couple months um, that are going to be cool, and I think will change um, cool. It will give some cool options from other styles of guitar. Um, but yeah. So, oh yeah, Rasmus, I can. I'll grab your mandolin here in a second. Um, I'm losing. I'm losing too many comments. That's okay. Um, oh yeah, full ADD there. Um, so Paul Reed Smith and the, and the tour was really fun. Cool tones, some cool pedals coming out. Um, they already have the pedals out. There's nothing new coming that I know about or heard or saw, but I got to play them and, uh, the compressor is really fun. Um, I don't, it feels like a piece of studio gear and that's what they're going for. Um, I'm in my infatuation with compression. It's going away, <sighs> but I, uh, Yeah. Got to play some stuff, and I got to play the full, like, six tiers of um, of PRSs the other day. And I got to really kind of articulate my thoughts on, or tease apart my thoughts between, like, the Paul Reed Smith, the SE, the S2, uh, the CE, getting into core, and just how much difference there actually is between those two so anyway that's it's a good brand that's kind of where i got the idea to talk about the stuff from this week so uh this week let's talk about gear shaming let's talk about uh guitar snobbery now part of this is i'm going to give you a master's guide on how to do it but i hope you see as we do it that i'm advocating the exact opposite and we're doing this in a facetious matter no i can't tell there's a i have a true story about the word facetious um that involves my older brother and my high school english class and uh, much embarrassment down the road. Um, but let's jump in. Rasmus, um, yeah, I can grab your mandolin's actually close. No, mm -hmm. hang on. The bridge, I'll, I'll get it out so you can see it. So Rasmus bought a, a Gibson mandolin, and it's here, and it's going to come with me when I go to see him this summer. Here it is. So, I'll take your comment off so that we can see. So, I haven't I haven't tuned it up, but it is here waiting for you, ready to go. So, it's a really good, like a good burst, beautiful back. 
really great maple. No real issues. Um, yeah, the I mean, you know the neck heel is separating just a scooch. Um, strap button it looks to have been swapped. But that's it. Whoa, whoever played it, there's like a... I don't know if you can see that. There's some kind of beautiful playware on it. You can see just where the light is glaring there. Yeah, what model is this? I think it's an A2, and I, I know... I remember very few of the details. I think it's an A2, and I think it's, what, 40s? What's the headstock? Is it the Scripty logo? Yeah, I think it's 40s. Yes, that's an A-type mandolin. Um, the F would have the scrolly bit. Um, internally, this is really wild. The Acoustic Shop has done a cool video of this. They show you the cross-section, like what an A-style looks like inside versus an F-style, and they literally... They're the opposite of what you would think. Like, you would think an A is smaller because there's just less wood... But the chamber is about the same. So 1942. So that's a wartime, you know, pre-war. You could you could call it a pre-war, and people couldn't be that upset with you. An A double O, maybe. Um, it's I mean, there were what at least twelve models. An A one through an A twelve. And then there might have been an A double O. So who knows? I don't know much about mandolins. I need to know more, and I keep kind of working to know more. I've been playing a lot of mandolin the last couple of weeks. But so with all this, let's talk about uh, guitar snobbery. Let's jump into this. And at the end, we're gonna have kind of a master's guide. Like here's how you do it. And I hope you understand that I'm being facetious as I do this. All right, guitar snobbery. The definition of snob is helpful, which is one who has or one who has an offensive air or superiority in matters of knowledge or taste. Think about who does that remind you of? Which brands come to mind when you feel that? I will say, and I'm not trying to critique people's fashion or people. Uh, let's just say this. The Paul Reed Smith event on Wednesday, there were a lot of gray ponytails and a lot of leather jackets and a lot of Chuck Taylors. And a, a shocking amount of people still smoking cigarettes. I couldn't get over that. Like, it was probably a third of the group that was there was smoking cigarettes, which was wild. Um, and I'm not saying that it was... It's been a long time since I've been around, like, a rock guitar shop. Um, that's not my vibe. That's not my style. Um, but there was definitely kind of a, like, bro mentality. Lots of people with, like, literal, like, PRS tattoos on their bodies. There's a second definition that I do think is helpful, which is talking about guitar snobbery and the definition of snobbery being a person with an exaggerated respect for high social position or wealth or, or uh, social position or wealth who's, who seeks to associate with superiors and dislikes people or activities regards as lower class. This is what I grew up with. Um, my, and I want to be careful because my dad does watch these videos sometimes. Um, I was brought up to be pretentious. I like, I was just trained to think that I'm better and smarter and that my family makes more money and that we're better. And, uh, I was just brought up to believe that. I don't think my parents meant it in any bad way, condescending way. I think they had such deep aspiration for themselves and for their family. They wanted us to work hard and to succeed and to break out of the middle class. And we're still very much in the middle class now. Um, but I think that there it, it gets to a place where there becomes a contempt for ordinary things. That is what kills me and what I will fight against in the guitar snob culture. The idea of gatekeeping, keeping people out of a certain space, not allowing them to, uh, not choosing to invalidate their experience and their playing uh, because of the guitars that they own, the guitars they don't own, what guitars you have, how those guitars were made, what finish was put on those guitars. There are a million ways in which you have to develop a stronger sense of self that is not swayed by how people perceive, per perceive you. Um, so, anyway... 
Um, it is interesting as you kind of work through this. I mean, this is literally Gibson's bread and butter. I mean, they said it themselves. They said, only a Gibson is good enough. And we have taken that to heart. And I think it was just a clever marketing line. Like, let's be honest. It's one of the most iconic and memorable guitar marketing lines that we've heard along the way. I don't know if I can think of another one. Like, what is another phrase that when you say it, you associate it with a brand? Play authentic? Um, what was, Fenders. What was Fenders for a long time? Um, I don't remember. Um, but, yeah, what do you guys make of, what do you guys make of this so far? Talking about, uh, yeah. Gibson Custom Snobbery claiming all Gibson USA models are trash and cheap out on and cheap out on construction. Personally, I found Gibson Custom Shop guitars to be significantly better in playing than the USA. Interesting. That's a hard where you're like, well, there's this big thing that you're kind of feeling, but then it shakes down into like my own experience actually kind of validates that. Um, that's a bit tricky. Um, every hobby has snobs. I don't know what brands become snobby unless their unless their purpose is to appeal to snobs. Luxury brands like Louis Vuitton, Ferrari, etc. That's a good point. Rasmus, go eat dinner. Hi, man. Elliot, I like the idea that you can that you can like the finer things, but not be a snob. Just as long as you don't look down on accessible stuff. I like that too. I'm really with you. German engineering equals BMW. I love that. One of my favorite, probably my favorite YouTube channel on right now is uh, Hoovy's Garage. And his mission is to prove that German engineering is just marketing. And he just regularly buys these German cars that are just falling to pieces. And he fixes them up and saves them. Yeah, Fender learned to play. Yeah, that's they've really kind of tried to stake out the territory around like entry level players, intermediate players, people who are DIY making music in their basement. Um, they have not gone like the Gibson route has just time and time again been like it's a luxury item. It is uh, culturally significant and it is a real guitar and they don't sell like you have to come to their level. They're not going to find a way to make a guitar for you um, at a thousand dollars or whatever. Inter I remember that. Yeah. Whenever you're ready. Yeah. I remember that. Brandon says, most players are snobs in regards to their own position. When I was 19, I was all about LTDs and ripped on people wasting money on high-end gear. I'm more of a Gibson snob. Now, it's true. I've seen you with a couple Gibsons. Um, yeah. John, question, 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 question. Hi from Philly. I have a new Larave 0044 on hold. Uh, Going to get her next week. $1,900. Good deal? Yeah. I mean, I don't know that guitar very well, but man, I love Larave's. Every one I've played is great. Audio is out? What do you mean out? Anyone else having that? Brian Panel. Hey, buddy. How are you? Brian, someone was talking about you in the guitar shop the other day. Not the good things. Oh, no, no. They were all... It was someone talking about your classical guitar style and playing down uh, playing down super low. Okay. Can people hear me? Is audio normal? There's like a 15 second. Audio is A-OK -okay on YouTube. Okay, Brian, you might, might either be something on your thing or you might have to go over to YouTube. To be honest... Every every fan of a brand can get snobbish about. Yeah, okay, I get what you're saying now. They seem to gatekeep when they want to shut everyone else out. Okay. Okay, so Ryan's watching on Facebook. Thanks, Ryan. Um, watching on Facebook, and he's got audio over there. Uh, PRS snobs say, a PRS sounds like a Fender that sounds like a Gibson that stays in tune. That's a good line of logic. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's interesting to me that over the years, Gibson has continually said it, but they're not alone in this. And I'll tell you a quick story. Um, one of the oldest ones that I know of is Martin versus Taylor. And um, this one makes me particularly sad because I have 100% played into this. 
I've 100% made fun of people for having Taylors um, and not having Martins. And then when people do have Martins, I have made fun of them for not having the right Martin or at least insinuated that their experience is invalid compared to my experience. So I'll tell you the first story. Um, I was 18 years old. Um, I was, I just finished my freshman year in college. I was volunteering. I was on summer staff with Young Life. And I was at a place called Frontier Ranch out in Colorado. And we, uh, Colorado. And my friend JD was telling me about guitars and he'd brought a guitar and he was leading worship that night. And, uh, he had, he pulled out this tailor and it was actually really, really cool. Now that I look back on it in my mind's eye, he had a tailor that it was called the dove and it was a, it was a limited edition that they did for praise and worship. And so his, it almost like a Paul Reed Smith, like it had birds on it and this guitar, he, played it and it sounded really good i didn't i don't know i just hung on to all the opinions i'd heard from people around me that like tailors aren't good and they don't sound good and they don't have bass and low end and that pickup sounds awful and they're for people that only want to be seen playing guitar blah 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 and so i said these things like i just was an idiot 18 year old and i was just ripping on this guy's guitar and he's like he eventually stopped and just said like hey shep like Hey man, like, I mean, I think you need to know a couple things about that guitar. Like, I don't care that much about guitars. That's the guitar my mom gave me. And my mom got that guitar at a charity fundraiser for her because she had cancer. And uh, she'd been asking the Lord to give me a guitar. And uh, so at this thing, they gave $20 to buy a raffle ticket to be entered into this thing for, uh, for this guitar. And she won it. So, like, the Lord gave me this guitar. And, like, I get it, but isn't that the point of why we're here? Like, we are here doing Young Life stuff. We're leading worship. We're telling people about Jesus. Like, and I was super embarrassed. Uh, It's the first time I ever really felt... Because I all of a sudden felt the guilt of saying things I didn't actually mean. If I thought them through at all, like, I didn't care. I hadn't played that many Taylor guitars. I had never known one, but it was just this, like, ridiculous thing. I also had just started working. Interesting. Hang on, I'm trying to remember the timeline. I had just started working at a guitar shop when I did this. So, anyway, it just, man, it was wild. So, uh, that was just one of the bigger, more embarrassing stories of my life in the in the. Martin versus Taylor because I realized people play guitar for a whole bunch of different reasons and it's as it's an especially dumb thing for me to do to make sure that there are less guitar players in the world especially for people that are just kind of getting into it and um yeah so it was very humbling very embarrassing and yeah so I'll come back over here yeah yeah, Jesse says I've always looked down on Taylor's and had Martin and had Martin held high. Yeah, I I always kind of felt the same way, and so I would do this thing of like comparing Martin and Taylor. And it wasn't until I came to the realization I was twenty couple, like in two thousand seven or two thousand eight, I bought a used uh, early two thousands Taylor seven twelve CE with a cedar top. And it was the best, most articulate, wonderful sounding guitar I had ever um, played. And it was the first time I got what Taylor guitars were trying to do. Every note was the same volume. The fingerboard was flat and wide. And I could just play that guitar for hours and it sounded excellent. I could also play really clearly because I had room for my fingers to work and for my hand to work. And so for me, man, that... That was when I was like, oh, Taylor is trying to make the best guitars that they can. Like Taylor is moving in a direction that that Martin just isn't really interested in following. Martin is more interested about legacy and tradition and Taylor's more about innovation. And so one thinks the best guitars behind you and the other one thinks the best guitars are in front of you. And so I've tried to articulate that. I've made a handful of videos kind of talking about that. But for me, like I now have a really helpful perspective on guitars, which actually comes from a stand-up, a bit of stand-up comedy 
uh, from Patton Oswalt. And Patton says, when I was in my 20s, there was music that I loved and music that I would argue about. And now there is music I love and music I don't care about. And so now for me, that's where I have kind of come to terms. Like there are guitars that I love and there are other guitars. There's not my thing. And I don't lose sleep over it. And I don't, I feel no compulsion to make people f feel a different way about them. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I've got one of those stories. I'm sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> the aliens, that's so funny. How could a loving and all-powerful God give you a tailor? <laughs> that's good. I'll, I'll tell JD that. So that one, that, that one bugged me. I mean, it's also my personality. If I say something that um, is hurtful and it doesn't hit me until it's hurtful later, like it'll bother me for years and I'll eventually call people and reconcile and make up and, um, I mean, I've, I've done it in the last couple of years. I've called people about stuff that happened long ago. But, um, yeah, it's really hurtful. Like, our words are able to bring, um, not literally, but heaven or hell. Like, you can bring peace and rest and being known and being at, uh, being at peace in the active present, like, power of peace or in the place that divides and diminishes and just... Yeah, tears people apart. Like you're, you are, you have creative power in, like you are, we are burdened with creative power that we can bring forth the presence of either the best of life or the worst of life by what we say. And I think a lot of times we just end up doing that. Um, yeah, so I think that's all I kind of want to say about Taylor guitars. Now, the other one is there's definitely like a Paul Reed Smith. Um, hierarchy of guitars, which we did, we haven't talked about Gibson yet. I think I may have skipped. Uh, well, let's go back and talk about Gibson for a second, because I only talked about their slogan of like only a Gibson is good enough. But Gibson is probably the single largest offender and purveyor of gear snobbery and of gatekeeping and making sure you come out. The biggest thing is um, they continue to focus on like the biggest rock stars, the most important musicians, like, um, and they keep pushing you like full force this, like, well, this is what professional musicians use. They use Gibson guitars. They use, you know, J 200s, J 45s. They use Les Pauls. They use SGs, 335s. And then for anyone that wants to come into that world, you have to buy an Epiphone. And then there's such a level of insecurity with Epiphone that it's just you constantly feel like you're not good enough that you compromise. You didn't have enough money to get it. Your parents, oh, man. If it hits different now that I am a parent and my kids are starting to want things. Uh, but I know my dad worked really hard to help us get certain... My brother played guitar a little bit, not as much as I did. Uh, but I know my dad worked really hard for me to have things like, you know, a PV XXL head or um, he also really helped me get a, a, a Martin 00016 RGT. Nope, 0016 SGT. Um, never should have sold that guitar. But anyway, uh, Gibson is one of the ones that you'll hear these phrases like, um, get a real guitar. Like, oh, I got my first real guitar. Uh, real. I heard that that accent come through on that one. Uh, but you get your first real guitar. And um, yeah, it just it bums me out. Makes me sad. Uh, so PRS is still kind of in the same way. It's a much bigger deal now that it's a PRS, like Paul Reed Smith SE for the entry-level logo. Instead of the original ones were SE, and then it was like tiny Paul Reed Smith. Um, I just had, I can grab it. Like this is a guitar that has a funny like identity crisis when you look at the branding on this one. So this is my, uh, my Falcon and it's like Falcon by PV. And it's just a funny, like, yeah, just how they shook out all of it. 
Um, and I understand, well, yeah, I guess the way Fender would have done this is they would have said Fender real big. And then, let's see, yeah, they would have said Fender real big and then the model name underneath it. But this one says the model name and then all the other stuff. Um, but yeah, Gibson for sure. It does mean a thing. I think I asked I asked the guys at the shop what they thought about gear snobbery because we both see it and feel it and experience it and we still do it at times, not on purpose. But um, so what Stephen said was that uh, it is a way it comes from insecurity that a lot of people they will get that guitar to feel like they earned it or they to feel like they deserve it to validate their own insecurity. And he said in some ways it gives him confidence. Like he said in the past, certain brands, like he plays Jackson a lot. I doubt he's watching. Steven, you better not be watching. You're working. Um, but uh, he said that it gives him confidence to play shows, which that's really interesting. Like having a pro level guitar on your headstock does really help. So I think the next one behind that, uh, as I work through the stuff with Paul Reed Smith, the SE is now they've done a really good thing to put the same name on the headstock. Very similar compared to the S2, the CE, and as you move up their line. Um, and they've, I don't know, they're playing with that ratio of what features they offer at what price point. And um, so, anyway, I think that some of the original Paul Reed Smith, like, think back to the movie Airheads, where for him, like, it's like a hostage negotiation, and he wants something absurd. And the thing he wants is a PRS Dragon, and so I wonder, that must have been such a big deal for Paul Reed Smith guitars at that time. Um, but yeah. Uh, the other one that is much less, but it definitely still happens, is Fender. And I think back to all of those shows in high school where I was like pixel peeping, like leaning up on a band. And I would see, you know, like, oh, he's playing a Fender Telecaster. And then you'd get close to see, like, is it made in the U.S.? Because if it's in the U.S., this is a good band. And if it's made in Mexico or Korea, like, oh, I guess they're just, like, kids. Um, and I remember seeing, uh, like, real bands. Um, I just remembered the other day that I saw Good Charlotte, like, way before they were big. In, like, 97 or 98. Well, 97, it would have been 10, so it couldn't have been then. But I started going to shows at 12 with my oldest brother. Um, but we saw Good Charlotte play at the Anthony Seeger Hall in Harrisonburg. And, um, but I remember them playing, one of them was playing a Mexican, like a made in Mexico Fender Strat with a humbucker. And, um, yeah. So anyway, I know that there's still a level of like, there's such an infrastructure of Squire now and Squire has become so good, but there still is such a stigma to having Squire on your headstock. And I know because I took my, my Tom DeLong Squire and I refinished it and I put a Fender decal on it. So there's a heavy burden that you carry. Um, and I know like my friend Matt that used to play in a band called Sing Sing Prison um, that he ended up like just taking a pocket knife or an exacto knife and scratching off made in Mexico. And it just said made in. And uh, yeah. And then later we ended up getting a logo and putting a made in the U.S. logo on there. Brandon says, double-edged sword on buying really high-end. I bought a PRS Tremonti USA 10 top and had so much anxiety about it and getting it dinged and scratched on my gigs, I stopped playing it out. Man, that's true. Yeah, like they become so precious, you know? Um, David Scott Brown, Yamaha is going, is going to own everything anyway. They just bought Guild. You guys might be talking about that. I'm going backwards through the comments. I don't believe it. Gibson's not over. They got a lot of market share and life left in them. Um, BMW is great. They're no VW. I will say Volkswagen like literally lied to the entire world for 40 years. They made up the fact that there is clean diesel and there is no such thing as clean diesel. And they made their cars recognize when they were being tested and run differently to pass emissions tests. I mean, it is corruption at the absolute highest possible tier. So anyway, just for what it's worth. Um, 
I'm just jumping around here. Sorry. So Brandon says, I've never owned a Martin. What? Let's fix that. I always consider them to be granddad's guitar. Uh, what that really means, though, in my house is is my house is paid off. I'll buy one. Sure. Hey, I'll, I've will i owned a bunch of Martins, and I've never paid off a house. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, I'm with you. I think I'm always really daunted by how expensive Gibsons are to buy. Just in general, I'm like, I don't know. Can I try one for 2500 bucks? Um, and so that's where it's like they hold their value, but they just where they start is a lot of money. Um, so that's why I've only owned a handful of Gibson. Uh, yeah, I get that. Everyone lies, Dr. House. Um, but uh, yeah, but there's more to it than that. Um, to walk in the truth as he is in the truth. Um, double side, you already read that one. Patty Pay Stubs is not sure if anyone brought this up, but I find there's snobbery with boutiques as well. Sometimes somebody will crap on Martin Gibson Factor or Martin Gibson Taylor because they're factory made. Boom. That's really, really true. Lots of people are like really poo pooing. Um, and I'm kind of there. I'm not there, but I'm now to a place where I like, I prefer and actually have more boutique guitars than I have factory guitars. Like look behind me. Like I have a Paget Model One, I have a Santa Cruz. Uh, there's a Gibson Southern Jumbo back there. Then I have. Uh, oh, I looked the wrong way. Then I have. Oh, I have a Taylor back there. Um, you guys haven't seen this one at all. That Taylor back there. That one's a Sassafras back in sides, and then my Boxwood over on the other end. But I end up like my Wright Lutheries over here, and so and I wouldn't even call the Ferk. I have two Ferks. They're factory. But they're a more precise kind of factory. Anyway, there definitely is a boutique-y twinge to it. So, all right. Um, I have Squire. We've talked about Squire a bit. Squire is the one. Squire and Epiphone are the most shit-upon brands by people. And the thing is, they are offering the best guitars for people at that price range and at that skill level. Like, if you're getting into music and you want to learn how to play... I mean, there's just no option better. I mean, maybe the PRS SE stuff, like get into the standard stuff for the Epiphones. But for Squire, I mean, for, I mean, if you've not played a classic vibe or an affinity or some of the 40th anniversary stuff from Squire, I mean, it's, they are as good as the Mexicans in the 90s. And the Mexicans in the 90s were as good as American made uh, fenders from the 70s. And so, there really is like the quality is getting so good and you can still get those for like 400 bucks, 300 bucks. So anyway, there's lots of room. Now the one that I definitely still kind of poo poo on is ovation. Sorry. I couldn't find a white logo and I didn't feel like going into Photoshop in the 10 minutes I had to get ready for this. So ovation, I have picked on a lot. I've owned, I've never owned an ovation, but I've owned an applause by ovation and it's just, anyway, I have two of them coming in the next couple weeks, and I'll do a review on them. I'm curious to see how they look and sound and play and feel uh, in the next little bit. But ovations, you have to really kind of gird your loins um, for when people are going to say, like, hey, you should get a real guitar, um, whatever it is. I don't know what that voice is, but that's usually the voice that comes out. It's just some good old boy heckling me in the guitar shop. Um, that's what, when I moved to New Orleans, I realized... My experience is not like my experience of redneck is not Alabama, Louisiana redneck. That's a different kind, uh, like a different breed of redneck. Um, but around here, I grew up with hillbillies and uh, like a lot of like high pitched. Hey, man, come on, get out here. Like a lot of that higher pitched, uh, you know, like, hey, you pecker woods, that kind of thing. That's I literally think of a person that was two, uh, two gun Terry. Let's see who that was. So, okay. So, oh, hang on. These are out of order. Okay. So here's my expert main. And no, this is not an expert level. This is um, just my first pass through working through this earlier today. How to be a gear snob. Here's your how to guide. Number one, make people feel bad at all times for what they have and what they don't have. Um, that is the single thing as I think about gear snobbery is just an active participation or willingness to 
inflate your own ego and to make yourself feel better and making other people feel bad. It is fundamental, fundamentally and principally to live in a zero sum world. And that just isn't the world that we live in. Like success is an infinite resource. Joy and creativity are a gift that is given to all of us. And it's pretty dark to shut that down in people. So don't be a dick. Make sure that people, if they are, and this is one of the things that I'm now training our salespeople at Hometown Music. When somebody comes in and they say, I only have $300 and I want to play rock and roll. Just my training to them is be excited. Like start with excitement. Remember what it's like to be 14 and to want to start a band and to have this money that you worked hard for um, to get a guitar or that your parents are like breathing down your neck to get, um, you cannot exceed this budget. So lead with excitement, cultivate that and just, yeah, I mean, they are no threat to you. And, you know, so that's where like for our salespeople, I'm like, don't walk them to the wall of thousand dollar guitars to start with. Let's find the coolest thing in their price range. And then while they're doing that, show them the cooler things, but show like, show them in the way of like, hey, see how similar this is? Like this thing has the same kind of pickups that you, the guitar that you were playing has. And look how cool, like, yeah, so that's why it's another thousand dollars, but this thing is awesome. So lead with excitement and make, so the exact opposite of what I say here, make people feel good, bring good energy to people. Remember, you are burdened with creative power um, to create a really good place to be or a really bad place to be. So for me, I choose to make the best world I can in every situation that I'm in to bring light and levity and joy and peace. Um, and that also means standing up to uh, bullies because there are going to be a lot of bullies in here. We get gear shamed by people coming into our shop like, oh, you don't have, you're not a Gibson dealer. We get that all the time. You're not a Martin dealer. And we're like, no, we're not a Martin dealer because, and then we walk through it. But um, yeah, number two on how to be a snob. Uh, repeat just biased guitar opinions like real guitars or so real guitar players have all solid back and sides. Um, just repeat. I would say if you want to be really good at being a gear snob, just really stick to every cliche that you hear in guitar shops or on message boards. <laughs> Probably more on message boards. Um, only Gibson's good enough. Um, you have to have Alnico humbuckers or, you know, it needs to be Seymour Duncan. Oh, you don't have CTS pots? Um, or, oh, it's a laminate back and sides. Well, it can't sound good if it has laminate back and sides. Just whatever people present to you, have a controversial and opposite opinion. That's a pretty good strategy for alienating people and destroying community. So I think some people are into that. So I just want to be helpful. If you want to destroy the world, here you go. <laughs> Point number three, base your identity entirely around guitars and gear and lead with hostility. If anyone has an opinion different than you, they are assaulting you as a person. Uh, and, you know, you just, you need to um, take it personally and then make really catty judgments of their life and style and all that stuff. Um, I think that's what's tricky is when people like, that's the uncle Rico thing, right? Like when you think through, that's the uncle that missed his opportunity to play football in Napoleon dynamite. So, um, yeah, when your identity becomes, and that's, what's so tricky with some of our moment right now is so many people are letting things like good things come to the center of them. Um, and they're putting them as like, if I'm not this, I am nothing. If I'm not, uh, good at swimming, I am nothing. Or if my kids aren't good at a sport, then that must mean I'm a bad parent. And if I'm a bad parent, then my dad won. And you know, it just spins out to where people don't know who they are. So I think the bigger component of this, and we see this again, I see this in the shop and I see this more often when I deal with people that are buying and selling guitars or in the guitar world. I just see people that have no bearing on who they are and it is all subjective to what they have done and what they're able to do. And the moment they aren't able to do those things, um, then they have a crash, uh, like a crash or a crisis and it really, really messes with them. All right, I'm going to turn this off and come over to the comments and we've got, I've got two more things after this. Uh,
West Coast races. Laravays are the most guitar you can get for the money. Best acoustic I've ever played was a DO3R. Still regret selling it. I think that Laravays are an unbelievable quality of a guitar. They're very, very, they're a really good middle road between how Taylor builds a guitar and how Martin builds a guitar. More on the Martin side, but they're like very clear and articulate, and you can really hear a lot of note separation. Not that Martins aren't that way, but Martins are like big and boomy. Where Taylor's are, or the Laravays are more kind of in the middle. Let's see the SJ. I'll show you the SJ here at the end. Grant says the QC on factory guitars seems to change over time. No, uh, small bench, not so much. I think it's just, yeah. I would. I think that. I think that that both of those are true, but I don't think that correlation equals causation. I think that when you have a smaller team and like smaller team usually means closer to the vision that started the organization. So like Nathan Wright is not going to send out a guitar that he does not love because he's literally putting his name and his signature on it um, where you're pretty removed. Like Taylor guitar is building how many they build 20 or 30,000 guitars a year, like maybe more than that, probably more than that. But they're building a huge amount of guitars. And the person that's like putting the final like nut slots in, their last name isn't Taylor. They don't care. It's kind of a gig. Like, so I get it, but I don't know if those two are necessarily connected. <laughs> Guess who's back? Rasmus is back. Back again. I bet that song came up before Rasmus was born. Takamini! Takamini are great. That's what the right sound says. Uh, there was a great Takamini that came in the shop earlier today. Send snobbery and snobs to hell! Play because you love it and the snobbers will will die! <laughs> I like this. Ephem, you will always play better with good energy. That's true. I think, yeah, I agree with that. David, Jeremy, that, or Jeremy, that is the point. Remember where you started. The thrill, the first, the second, the third instrument. Sitting up, uh, sitting up half the night, looking into your, looking at your three hundred dollar wonder. It's so true. Alnico not <laughs> Uh Tex, that guitar sounds awesome. Twelve fret models are super cool. Period. Oh, a year after my wife died, I ordered a Martin Custom Shop D twenty eight twelve fret VTS. Works well with my wounded fretting hand. Fantastic playing and sounding guitar. I. I could remember her. Wow, man. That's so sweet. <sighs> yeah. And Tune says, my Martin DM has HLP sides, but it sounds great. Yeah. Those, man, those sound exceptional. Like the X series has always had tons of bass and low end and boom. Uh, yeah. Here's somebody from Turkey. Look at this one. Hello, in Turkey the guitar prices are so high most of the time that you have to have a you have to be a guitar snap because there's no chance of trying them out. No owner lets you play expensive models like a J45 or D28. I've heard the same thing of people in uh, Egypt and then I just realized I looked at my Google Photos today 6 years ago today I was in Lebanon and I was checking out a guitar shop in Beirut uh, in Bushamud. Dude, 1,000%. I remember working at the guitar shop and the old dudes coming in, crapping on the gear. Back in my day. Yeah. It's hard, man. It's so hard when people have built their identity around things and it just becomes so... Uh, they become so scared, you know? Um, if any of that threatens or shifts or moves. And it all does. Like, the signposts by which you make sense of who you are and where you fit into the world are going to move in your life. And so you have to work through trusted relationships and things that are more like meaningful and eternal to just set your identity around and where you belong and how people relate to you. Um, it just makes you a healthier person. And I'm not even talking from a Christian perspective. I'm just saying like from a healthy person perspective. Um, yeah. 
Stan says, thanks for the wisdom download today, Jeremy. Oh, sure thing. This is, yeah, I've been, I've been wanting to do something like this um, for a while. Philip, the, the DO5 has been, uh, has been with me for almost 20 years, and it will stay with me till I'm gone. That's good, man. What a great guitar. Uh, what are your thoughts on the Blue Ridge BR-63? So that's the triple O, it's like a triple O-18. Very similar to an Eastman E6OM. So gloss, uh, mahogany back and side, spruce top. Um, they're really good guitars. It's a great, I mean, that's a great, uh, level of guitar. They're still under a thousand bucks, I believe. Um, I've sold those for a long time. Um, yeah. You might want to check out the E6 OM. What's the, I'll have to remember what the eight is. I still don't know those numbers super well. Yeah, small bench. Small bench builders are all about QC, and it's literally because it's just like their names are going on them, and there's fewer people. And, yeah, I mean, it's not... I don't know. I mean, we've had a few things come from... We've had, a, we've had to return one PRS in the last couple months and one Fender. And the Fender had a nut that was just really poorly fit, and it just would never work... 100% like it looked like it had been replaced it was just too rounded over and um it was very buzzy and cut too low and then we had a PRS custom 24 come in an SE that the tremolo like was binding on the side of the inside of the body and it was just put oh it was just mounted too far to the base side and so it just it would catch the guitar worked fine unless you use the tremolo and it went and it would stick like out of tune, but just detuned. And so uh, both of those, they immediately just like, hey, we'll send you a new guitar. So we sent them back. And both of those, I mean, we got new guitars within three or four days. So um, bigger brands are better to quickly fix things compared to small bench. Uh, but yeah. Who cares what kind of guitar you have if you can't play? A cheap guitar is the right in the right hands can sound amazing. Just get a guitar that you love and can afford and have fun. Yeah, I do think one of the phrases that are that's so good um, is uh, the right guitar for you is the one you already have. And for most people, to get a guitar is not hard. Um, for me, like, guys, I have probably 40 guitars in this room. I have an obscene amount of guitars. And most days, I kind of think, like, what if I sold everything and I just kept one? Like, I'd probably keep my Guild D40. Like... Or I would I would just keep a simple guitar, um, because specialization is amazing and I love it and I'm very thankful that I've gotten to do this for so long as what I've done and amazing to see what has happened with other people that have learned how to buy and sell guitars and to find the right guitars for them. But I do think that simplicity is really critical. So coming back. Um, Still trying to catch up. Rasmus, yeah, I do know you. I know you pretty well. Oh, yeah, I saw that. I saw a text. There was some guitar you sent me yesterday. Um, Jake Weber, I'm 63 years old, and I have a guitar for the money that's fantastic today. And I think the guitar for the money is fantastic today. Better than ever in my life. I would agree. I mean, acoustic guitars right now are the best. That they, well, no, I think I can just say guitars in general. Um, like look at what you would have spent. I remember spending $899 for my Epiphone, uh, Les Paul custom black beauty, three humbuckers. And I got it and it was a blemish headstock. Like the headstock was completely milky and like covered over. And I still spent $800 on that guitar. And I just, I don't know. It was, yeah, I don't. Comparing that now, like I just bought a PRS Custom 24, and it's just absolutely generations different than what you could have gotten. And that guitar was $849. So on the other end, uh, on acoustic guitars, right now, like you look at the the FERC uh, Blue series, is it the blue or the green? I think it's the green. That's a, right around 1000 bucks. It is un unbelievably good. Um, you look at the um, the Eastman, the E6 OM, the E1 is especially great at like 549 bucks. And so, you know, there is no guitar more magical to me than the Martin D18s from 2012 on. 
Like, I think everyone should own a D18. They're just absolutely exceptional. So. <clears throat> yeah, you've got that right Luthery. Yeah, we'll talk more about that. Um, <laughs> Philip, as someone who owns way too many guitars, uh, a lot of times someone who is unhappy with their guitar should should put their money should put their money into getting it set up and a little maintenance will bring it back. That's true for sure. Aaron, another YouTuber. So many YouTubers in the house today. Um, I'm currently downsizing. Feels good. I'm planning to have less guitars that are maintained better. Setup is everything. That is so absolutely true. Uh, I long for the day. I'm, I've been selling stuff and saying no to new stuff coming in. And I just have so much stuff that is just stuck in the hopper, you know. Uh, Paul Hooper says a lot of guitar snobbery comes from a financial state, i.e. who likes Martin. Gibson, if you will never be able to afford. Um, yeah, so. I, there's a lot. There's a lot tied up in here. I have, I have two more slides <laughs> and then I'll show you Gibson Southern Jumbo, a 68 Southern Jumbo. And uh, yeah. Uh, part four, um, pra or don't practice your guitar. Don't get your guitar worked on. Don't set it up, but just buy more stuff. Gear acquisition syndrome. I think the gear acquisition syndrome is the biggest excuse and it is such an awful misuse of your creative power and your time. It is almost always bad. For, it's great for guitar shops. It's great for guitar manufacturers. It's great for your credit card companies. And it's really bad for marriages. Like the amount of people that say, my wife said that she's going to divorce me unless I get rid of guitars. Oh, she doesn't even know about this new guitar that's coming. You know, people have confided in me that they have secret credit cards that they're buying guitars on. Um, hoping that they would get a YouTuber to talk about them. Someone actually asked me about this. Like, hey, could you make a video about this and say that they're excellent and they're so hard to find and then it'll, it'll make mine worth more? And that one, I was like, one, who do you... Th I, like, I don't have enough clout to affect the market. Like, I've affected the Guild acoustic guitar market this much, but no one else is talking about that stuff. Um, so... Gear acquisition syndrome is genuinely awful, and I hate it, and I want to wage war against it. I need to work out my thoughts to say them more cleanly. But I think it is a complete misuse. It's like when you're teaching your kid to play catch, and you throw the ball, and the kid catches the ball, kid throws the ball back. You throw the ball, your kid misses the ball, and you're like, here it is, buddy. Look, it's right there. And you point at it, and instead, I'll point this way so you can see. And instead of pointing, instead of looking, your kid doesn't know that there's an imaginary line from the tip of your finger to the thing that they want most in life. But what they just do is they just look at your finger. Gear acquisition syndrome is that. It is showing people your finger. It is just, it is not the thing you want, but it is the thing that indicates the thing that you hope you would want. What you want is a meaningful life with music that you like, with friends that you can enjoy making music with and playing music, and then you know going and getting to play music out and having a life that is full of meaning and purpose, being creative, making music, making friends. But instead, you just get stuck on showing people your finger on the, on the guitars and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, so if you really want to drive the, drive the nail into the coffin whatever this analogy is buy more gear buy more gear feel superior and uh, make sure people feel worse around you because they don't own the guitars they have they don't you know they're not ruining their life financially the way that you are um oh that's a copy that's the same one okay i only had one more slide there it is come back over here
How do you wage war against gas when gas fuels your guitar salsa business? My guitar sales business. Um, I regularly tell people to not buy guitars impulsively. I regularly tell people to not buy... Um, I've had several people reach out to me wanting to use certain products to finance guitars from me, and I have told them no. Uh, I said, I think it's irresponsible. I don't think it's a good idea. Now, I understand people are are independent, autonomous, completely. Uh, they, they are their own people. They can make their own decisions. They are adults. Uh, but to me, I, f I don't know. I think that certain things like the borrower is slave to the lender is painfully true. Um, and so I don't, I'm not in the slavery business. I don't want people to burden themselves. I don't want people, I'm pro marriage. I think marriage is a really good thing. And I think that people borrowing $10,000 or $8,000 for that 69D35 that are selling, I think borrowing money that your wife doesn't know you're borrowing on a credit card that you're only opening through me and that it's backed by me, that makes me complicit in a pretty bad decision for somebody's family. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't find that I, I don't often sell to people that are just guitar snobs that are aiming to yeah to to be in this whole category of what we're talking about i get a lot of people that are more kind of where i'm coming from i don't know if that's good i may have talked myself into a corner on that one matthew says i have a taylor 714 with the stock nickel tuners and i want to upgrade to the goto 510 tuners in the black smoke that's what um this guitar back behind me has um, I, yeah, do what you want to do. Uh, I, as long as the holes are in the same place, you'd have all, I mean, you could literally change it back without any, if you'd ever want to go back, you could change it back without anyone ever knowing that the tuners were changed. I should get into this all. Oh boy. Oh boy. I, I scrolled in. All right. We're I know they're better mostly, but I want to do it because it looks sweet. Yes. No, it's not snobby. I like customizing guitars. You're telling me the original Klon in Dumble won't make me instantly John Mayer? Heresy! <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's funny, man. Some I've wanted to make a video about this. Like, when you play your hero's guitars... And you realize, like, oh boy, turns out the difference between me and them is way more about me playing that guitar than the guitar itself. Like, I played Jason Isbell's D18 a couple of years ago, and I was like, hmm, don't like that. Um, and I was like, I don't sound any more like Jason Isbell than I normally do. And, uh, yeah, that's funny. <laughs> when you start sneaking guitar boxes into the apartment, you have a problem. Yeah, for sure. I my wife has been on board with every single guitar I have bought in my life. And we have a pretty simple like understanding which is my guitar deal will be good for our family. Like it it that's the criteria. It has to be good and so it's like if it doesn't make dollars it doesn't make sense. That's the other phrase in our world. And so I've not borrowed any money to do what you're seeing here. No credit cards, no debit or no debt. Uh, this has all been just cash flow along the way. And, uh, so, I mean, I'm incredibly proud of that and thankful for that. Um, but it's been a wild ride. Um, yeah. Cause it also means, I think one of the things that helps you not be snobby is like scrappy tends to fight out snobby. And so for me, like I, I'm never going to have $10,000 in the bank to buy that custom shop 57 that I want. So I then have to find like, well, if I want to get a guitar like that, I have to be open to an R8 or, a, you know, an R10. And I have to be more open to different choices. And, you know, uh, that's one of the things I, I find myself very rarely getting to pick guitars on finish because I'm like, well, that's the least I have the least control over that if I'm going to find it used. So. Oh, a lot of comments. I'm sorry. Late tune in. What up? Happy Friday. Paul, how are you, man? I'm glad you're here. Paul, I feel like you're going to like this one. Go back and listen from the beginning. Um, we're talking about gear shaming, making people feel bad for the guitars they have and the guitars they don't have. 
So, all right. Yep. Uh, you're to blame. You're to blame for me wanting a D18. Shame on you. Yeah, I'm sorry. There are guitars that I'm okay. Like, I'm, I hope you guys know, like, I'm, I'm really okay scratching the itch or like, is this a phrase? Is this an analogy I want to use? I'm okay setting up a, a desire, like starting to like tickle an itch, uh, tick to cause you to itch and want a certain kind of guitar. And then I'll help you get there without breaking the bank and without, you know, ruining your marriage. Um, so that's, that's my, <laughs> I love shaming. Yes. Yeah. That's what I was thinking about, you know, just, <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm okay setting people up for desire and then walking through the practical ways to then make that happen. Um, but yeah, so. Kramer, I was lucky enough to find a guitar I never thought I could buy for $2,000 less than I've ever seen. Sometimes the guitar is just calling out to you. It is true. Um, I think that fortune favors the bold. That's true. But fortune also favors... How do I say this? Um... If you're just in the game long enough, like it's about at bats, you know, and so that's where you start realizing that, like, well, if you just keep getting up to the bat, keep looking for stuff, keep like keep looking for stuff, you will keep finding stuff. Um, it is interesting because every now and then, uh, yeah, it's every now and then you find a thing. This is what's so hard. I find guitars that I just don't have the money or the means to get at that time. And that's where I just have to like finagle and move around and like beg and plead like, Hey, can you hold this for two days or can you do this trade or, um, <clears throat> to work through it? Joshua says, I can't imagine anyone needing a guitar enough to go into debt for it. I think, I think people, I don't think it's like, People know that they're making bad choices. I mean, let's be honest. Like, our culture borrows money all of the freaking time for everything. So it's not a normal thing to say, hey, like, I just use the money I have, and I put a little money away each month so that at the end of this year I can then buy that thing, and it wouldn't feel bad. Um, it's, you know, it's just an unusual um, thing. But I know that for us, the fact that we're debt-free has allowed us for me to be a YouTuber vocationally. And for me to buy and sell guitars, um, just because we have no debt other than our house. Um, and so that makes the whole budget a lot more friendly and we can handle more chaos, which chaos is speaking of unlimited resources. Chaos seems to be just without limit. I don't have kids or a wife. So, uh, and I don't have the other commitments of people, but I still am in love with my Boucher I bought a year ago. Didn't have to go into debt and built credit off of it, actually. Mm -hmm. Well, so you did use debt, but you used it before you got interest. Got it. If you want a 12 fret vintage V-neck, you got plenty of options. No, that is 100% debt. Because if that guitar would get damaged by you... Um, you would still have to pay for it. So, anyway. I'm Dave Ramsey till I die. Uh-oh! My battery died! Are we back? Heck, two batteries are dead. It's coming. Okay, we're back. What happened? That's crazy. Yeah, okay, well, I, uh, I think that's, that's a sign that it is time to go. Can you see me now? <laughs> it's what I've told myself in the past. Yeah, that's true. I yeah, I I've only had a credit card. I had a credit card for about a year, 
in my mid twenties when I started a business. People were like, you have to get a car note and you have to get this and you have to build your credit. And um, it has just, yeah, not been, anyway, my credit card was only ever like 300 bucks a month. I just covered expenses and then paid it all off at the end of the month. So anyway. Um, all right. Yeah. All right. So it, I think it's time to boogie. Um, let me show you that uh, Southern Jumbo real quick. Probably going to be pretty horribly out of tune, if I had to guess. So here is 69 Southern Jumbo, 68 Southern Jumbo. This is an inch and nine sixteenths nut width, so it's a very, very skinny nut. I'll, let me, yeah, I'll come back here. There we go. I guess if I have a microphone, I can be as far from the camera as I need to be. So. so skinny. has such a tiny little neck so anyway gives us southern jumbo that one is a 68 and 68 is about the least desirable of those years no it's not true 70s 70s are the most undesirable they're all awful um and i'll fight you um that one's not double x braced so single x braced it's the last year before double x bracing but this one still has a walnut bridge plate or rosewood bridge plate, has an adjustable bridge, has the pick guard, which is screwed to the top, which is not great. Um, yeah, but it's a fun guitar. So anyway, it's very easy to wrap the thumb, but it's like it's just tight. Everything is very, very close together. So anyway, um, all right. Well, thanks for hanging out. Uh, this is a fun Guitar Hunter Live and... Uh, yeah, I am very, very thankful for all of you. So make sure you hit the thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed. Thanks for watching. Lots of new subscribers coming in. And uh, so anyway, have a have a good one. It's been a fun time. And I think Phil McKnight's thing goes soon. GHS does a thing right after this sometimes. So I know that there's lots of fun guitar uh, content for us. So anyway, all right. Thanks, guys. Go fill the world with music and friendship. Bye.